Okay, well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to another uh, midweek Bible study. It's such a joy to see all of you, Vanessa, after a long time. And uh, we are happy that you could join us. And uh, uh, Mr. Sikandar also could join. It's such a joy that uh, we could gather and to learn more about God and His Word. And we'll, we'll start uh, our Bible study with a word of prayer as uh, uh, we are doing, uh, as we are regularly doing uh, the practice. Uh, of having 30 minutes of uh, uh, teaching which pastor dan will be giving us and afterwards it would be open it would be open for questions comments and discussions okay i'll uh, pray and start and uh, pastor can take over from there 30 minutes of uh, lecture or uh, class and then question and answers will be there let's pray father we are so grateful to you for this time thank you very much for bringing us here lord uh, to as brothers and sisters of Christ of one body uh, to come together and to study your word and to know about you and to learn about you and you, O oh Lord. I pray that your leading and guidance may be granted to us. We ask for your revelation and illumination in our lives, especially as Pastor Dan is uh, speaking and uh, teaching to us, Lord. We want to hear your voice through him uh, uh, and we may so that we may be able to uh, relate to you and we may be able to understand you we may be able to experience you more intimately uh, and we may progress in that oh lord uh, regularly lord i pray i give ourselves especially pastor dan and this time to the throne of grace we ask for your grace so that we may not have any technical glitches and uh, the entire study may go uh, smoothly and we may have some good and meaningful uh, uh discussions which encourage us lord thank you very much for listening to us in jesus name we pray amen over to pastor amen. good evening again to all of you uh, uh in these bible studies we have been uh, going through uh, our regular we believe uh, series and uh, we have been covering various fu fundamental and uh, basic doctrines, uh, of course, that comes from the Bible. But we as GCI have a special focus on it, and that is from a Trinitarian perspective. So uh, we have been doing that for several weeks now. But today I'd like to just take a break from that. And I would like to... Uh, do a study in the book of Habakkuk. And the reason for that is the recent events that have been taking place, uh, the situations we have been facing with regards to the, uh, the pandemic, the lockdown, and of course the unfortunate struggle that many, many uh, of our people have. And of course, most of you know through the uh, notifications that we have been sending. Right now, Christiana is struggling now in the hospital. I got an update this morning uh, that the doctors also are finding it extremely uh, critical. Uh, she, they feel she is in a very critical stage, and so that really, you know, I'm sure all of all of us feel very badly about that because I never thought any one of our members would struggle with uh, this particular disease. Uh, we were trying our best to take all the precautions. We did not have, you know, church. Uh, so I just am shocked that Christiana is positive and now it has affected her very deeply. Uh, Selena, her daughter is also positive and I had a chance to talk to her this morning uh, she is in isolation because of uh, the, uh, the the you know virus. She has to remain in isolation for at least ten to twelve days. Uh, uh, along with that, I just came to know of other you know very sad situations. You know, I just came to know uh, the wife of one of our ministers in the U.S. Her name is Barbara Rogers. And uh, he is, she is the wife of Dan Rogers. She was run over by a pickup truck. She was doing us, she was in a, on a cycle 
and she was run over by a pickup truck and she's got several fractures, including a pelvic fracture. And that was another news that really, you know, was so uh, unfortunate. Well, along with that came the news of many deaths. And the recent one was the death of uh, Nasama, who is the wife of our superintendent in Africa. Uh, Kalungale, his name is. Uh, and she died of a heart failure. Uh, she was struggling with a heart condition. And then uh, the passing of uh, three of our members in the Philippines. Uh, once again, one very long time member, an elder in the church, and other two uh, younger members. Uh, we were not sure exactly if the, it was the result of the, of, uh, the virus. When I was uh, going through and you know, trying to process all of this, uh, and of course, looking at the sufferings that's taking place in the world, there doesn't seem to be any coming back or coming down of the pandemic. Uh, not only in terms of health that we struggle and of course deaths that we are hearing, but uh, economic issues, uh, people losing jobs or not being paid salaries. Right now we are struggling because we are unable to help our teachers. You know, we have not, uh, the teachers in our school are only being paid half a salary because we have no income coming in. Uh, okay. Praveen, I'm not very sure <laughs> exactly how to do that. Uh, there will be a star uh, button on uh, top of your keyboard. On uh, your screen. You have your type keyboard, no? Yes, that's right. Yeah, yes. On top, star, star, will, star symbol button will be there, smaller one. Yes. Okay. Reduce it to, you know, yeah. Is that okay? This is better. Okay, all right. Uh, yeah, I learned something new. <laughs> anyway, coming back to what we were discussing, uh, uh, we are struggling with, you know, being able to help our teachers. Uh, and so all of these issues just um, going around in my mind, and I'm sure some of you may be going through some difficulties. We all go through difficulties. Being human means that we struggle with all kinds of issues. And as always, especially for us as Christians, we, we, you know, who believe in a good God, a loving God, we believe in a God who is all powerful. And so the big theological question that we can always ask is why? Why is this happening? Uh, why are we going through such uh, situations uh, when we trust and believe in God who is in control of everything. He's control of the whole universe. We sing about it. We read in the scriptures about that. And yet our you know, experience on the ground seems to be so difficult to understand from what we read in the scriptures. Now, so that's the reason why today I just wanted to take a break and look at this question. And today we are going to look at, look at it from the eyes of Habakkuk. Uh, he is a prophet in the Old Testament. He is one of the minor prophets. Uh, the books that are right towards the end of your Old uh, Testament. And when we talk about suffering and a good God and a loving God, we many times go to the book of Job. Now we all know that Job uh, is a is a very a popular book in terms of study uh, of suffering. But Habakkuk also has some very pointed questions, and today we are going to look at that. So we have discussed this many a times. We have discussed the subject about suffering and how we can reconcile suffering uh, with God who is loving and in full and full control. Uh, we, you know, if I can just introduce 
that word called theodicy. Theodicy is a theological term that is used to describe the struggle we face and reconciling that with a good God, a loving God. How can God be loving and all powerful and yet allow so much of suffering? And that is the, uh, the, the, the paradox of what we call theodicy. So let's revisit that question again. Let's look at that question this time from the eyes of Habakkuk. So I'm going to the book of Habakkuk and let me just make a few introductory comments. Then we look at a few of the scriptures. We will obviously not go through the entire book. It's a fairly complicated book. It's a you know it's a it's a book that has some very deep uh, you know discussions. We won't go into all of that, but we'll pick up some of the main uh, points which will help us answer the question we are going to ask. Habakkuk as a is a prophet. And we know very little of, all, of him with, through all the research that's done. But he probably lived in, you know, during the 600 BC, that is the time frame, maybe a contemporary of Jeremiah. So he probably lived around the prophet Jeremiah. So maybe overlap to some extent. Now, the book of Habakkuk has been quoted in the New Testament. Uh, you know, a few times. The Apostle Paul quotes him, the just shall live by faith. That comes from the book of Habakkuk, right? And of course, that big, that theme of faith comes very, very clearly. So uh, the book of Habakkuk, even though some people would like to find fault with it, is canonical. When we say canonical, it means that it is a, a book that is, uh, you know, part of the Bible as was set by the early church and so in other words the church does not have any questions about the, or the or the validity of the book in the bible so because it is quoted in the new testament so uh, habakkuk also asked this question of theodicy right a good and a loving god that is the revelation we have from the scriptures how do we tie it up with the existence of evil, the human experience? We all experience the effects of evil. And why does that happen when God so easily can eradicate sin? And of course, uh, we know he has and he will in its fullness. But nevertheless, uh, the questions keep coming back, especially when we face tough times, difficulty, especially when it is not our fault. We suffer because of somebody else's fault. Today, the whole world is suffering because of something that happened in a distant land. Uh, and we ask the question, why must I suffer for somebody else's mistake? So these are the questions that, uh, you know, we struggle with, I'm sure, uh, quite often. Now, Habakkuk also, you know, has the... Uh, what do you say, the, the courage to question God. Isn't that also something that we many times uh, are, are struggling with? We have a question mark. We look at God and say, God, why is this happening? And so Habakkuk questions God and he seeks explanations from God. He's asking questions to God and trying to ask, uh, you know, uh, uh, trying to seek understanding from God as to why is this happening? And the interesting thing is, once again, we don't get a complete answer. And that is perhaps, uh, you know, one of those frustrations we face. We have these questions, but we just are unable to answer the question. Or rather, we don't find direct answers to the question. But there is one thing that is very certain. Uh, patient faith is the answer finally and we will look at it in his uh, uh, in, the, in, in the scripture now what is his what is uh, Habakkuk's complaint let me go to the chapter one by the way there are only three chapters in this book so it's a very short book uh, and we will look at ch chapter one 
Uh, and re let's read the first few verses where we see the complaint of the prophet. All right. So it begins, if you see on your screen, it's, uh, it is the New King James Version. And it reads, verse 1, the burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. So Habakkuk is a prophet and he's got this burden, a burden that we all share with him. Verse 2 says, O Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? Even cry out to you, violence, and you will not say. Verse 3, why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Verse 4 says, therefore the law is powerless and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, perverse judgment proceeds. Look at the power of those verses, right? Uh, let's just, just uh, uh, you know, reflect on that for just a few moments. Uh, what is Habakkuk saying? He's saying, you know, my experience of you, Lord, or rather my, my revelation of you, my knowledge of you, my understanding of you is not... Uh, consistent with my experience i see violence and i see you know uh the, that the evil people are surrounding the righteous right the wicked people are troubling the righteous don't you see lord there is so much violence around us so his experience doesn't align with what he knows about god Notice verse 4, it says, therefore, the law is powerless. In other words, maybe he's trying to say that uh, what has happened to justice? I mean, uh, uh, haven't you given the law and aren't you in control? Uh, don't you uh, enforce the law? I mean, is, 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 is all of this of no value anymore? Uh, I, I'm keeping the law, but I'm not. I seem to be reaping something else. So Habakkuk is going through this discussion with God, right? When he says the law is powerless, what is the use of keeping the law when it's not being followed and enforced and people are nevertheless suffering? Okay. Uh, let me also read verse 13 in the book, uh, chapter 1, verse 13. Where it says, um, let me see, here it says, you are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness, right? Uh, why do you look on those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he, right? In other words, uh, once again, that's the complaint he has. Lord, you are so good that you don't behold evil. Now, of course, we have to look at it uh, from, you know, an understanding. It's not that God doesn't deal with evil or he cannot look at evil. Uh, we know that Jesus Christ came in the incarnation to deal with evil and to take on evil upon himself. But the way he's explaining it is, you are so pure, you are so good. Uh, and yet, why is it that you keep quiet? You're holding your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he, right? Uh, and then he continues to bring out this lament. What happened to justice when a righteous person is suffering? So I'm sure all of this sounds familiar, right? It, we all struggle with this, these thoughts. Uh, I have on many occasions. I look at what's happening around us today. You know, Christiana struggling. Oh, I mean, for what 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 fault of hers? You know, she she gets this virus from somewhere that came from some other place. Uh, you know, and of course, innocent people dying, uh, people continuing to struggle. Uh, so, how does God then answer Habakkuk? 
what does God have to tell us? And uh, I'm going to look at chapter 2 now. Uh, Habakkuk chapter 2. And there is a prophecy that God then brings out uh, through this prophet. Uh, and it's very interesting to see what how God begins to answer. And there are some interesting thoughts that we can take out of that. In chapter 2, verse 5, uh, is that coming up on the screen, uh, Praveen? Yes, okay. Okay. And um, all right. Notice it says in, 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 in uh, verse 5 indeed, because he transgresses by wine. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, am I in the right? Maybe if you can just go back to chapter one, uh, Praveen. Many a times I forget to write the chapter. I, I copy the verse and I forget the chapter. Verse five in chapter one. Yes, there you are. That, that's the right one. Uh, verse five in chapter one says, look among the nations and watch. Uh, be utterly astounded. For I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told you. Verse 6, for indeed I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation, which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Let me stop there. Uh, the verse mentions about Chaldea, the Chaldean, you know, um, and what is God saying here? Now, once again, we won't go through all these scriptures. Basically, God is saying here that he's going to use Chaldea, the, the Chaldeans, to as an instrument of punishment against Israel. But he also says that the Chaldeans will also face punishments for its misdeed. Something interesting that we can understand here. God is not a respecter of persons we know that he's not a respecter of nations he allows the whole world to struggle and suffer under the choices they make and many a times the choices have been uh you know evil and wickedness and disobedience and so god is saying that these things are going to happen even though habakkuk is complaining to god these things are nevertheless going to happen because Israel needs to be punished. And I'm going to use Chal the Chaldeans as an instrument. But the Chaldeans are not going to escape the punishment because as the verse, as these, uh, the few verses says, they are brutal. They are extremely fierce. Uh, they are bitter and they are hasty, as the scripture says. Uh, they devour, they take up things that doesn't belong to them and uh, this uh, god says they are terrible and dreadful in other words they ex use excessive force and so god allows that and so uh, they are going through this trouble i mean israel is going through the trouble another another question that we can ask here is and a question that you know many skeptics ask or many atheists ask and they say how come the bible is so much has so much violence right now that's a that's a deep question uh, we need more time to answer that question uh, but there are atheists who say they cannot believe in the bible because god orders genocide he tells israel to go and kill every man woman and child including the animals and so they bring out these arguments against the scriptures. But there is one thing we can keep in mind. It is not just Israel who was asked to go and kill, but Israel themselves faced this kind of harsh treatment from others. Just as God used Israel to punish other nations, he uses other nations to punish Israel. So uh, there is no favoritism there. There is no... Uh, 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 there is no uh, respecter of nations in that respect. But we'll come back to the bigger question as to why God has so much of evil or rather so much of violence in the scriptures. And it's actually 
it is not God who intended violence, it is human being, like he, like he talks about uh, the Chaldeans. When he uses them to punish Israel, the Chaldeans go to the extreme. And they are so dreadful and terrible in their dealings with the nations that they plunder. They are extreme in their plunder. And so uh, it was never God's intentions for, for human beings to be like that. But that's what happens when we move away from God. We move away from God's revelations and the way God wants things done. And that is what happens. Okay. Now, um, once again, we won't go back to chapter two. Um, rather, yeah, uh, 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 ch chapter two has many, you know, very, it seems almost confusing, some of those thoughts that come from chapter two, but chapter three is very interesting. If you read through chapter three, uh, we have God recounting some of the great things that has taken place in the past. He's recounting the history of Israel. Now here is Habakkuk, don't forget, Habakkuk is, is complaining to God, why are you allowing my people, Israel, to suffer so much? Why do I see so much violence? And then of course, God in chapter two explains a few things about the nature of human beings, the nature of, you know, and we, and we learned a little bit about that in the, uh, in the Chaldeans. But in chapter three, God begins to recount some of the history of Israel in the way God has dealt with Israel, the way he redeems them, the way he give, grants them protection. And so chapter two is a recounting of God's greatness in his acts of salvation and his acts of redemption. In that chapter, we are also reading how God establishes order by defeating chaos. You know, the whole world goes through all kinds of chaos, but God is the one who many a times establishes order. And in chapter three talks about the rebellious waters, uh, which is a, a symbol of the chaos that exists. And I, and I say that deliberately because you remember an interesting event in the New Testament with Jesus. Uh, you remember Jesus once walked on the water and uh, even while the waves were roaring and there was a storm on, on the sea, I think it's the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus walks on the water. And, uh, and that is the famous story of how Peter also wants to walk and he says, uh, you know, allow me to come to you. There is a, there's an interesting symbolism in that. The fact that Jesus walks on this water that is raging and foaming and, uh, you know, uh, maybe a storm brewing. It is symb symbolic of the fact that Jesus is in control on top of the chaos that takes place. The fact that he walks on water is helping us to see that Jesus controls, is in control of everything. The chaos does not and cannot, you know, derail him. The chaos and the storms cannot stop him from accomplishing what he came to accomplish. So, you know, this uh, uh, raging storm and rebellious waters is symbolic of evil. Jesus is above the evil, right? He is able to control it. And so chapter three, maybe in the book of Habakkuk is reminding us, hey, let's not forget God is still in control. Uh, and God has not lost control. And, and that's sometimes how we feel, don't we? We feel that where is God? Maybe he is not able to stop the pandemic. Maybe he's not able to stop these problems because we see so much of it taking place. But all of this is reminding, and now God is probably trying to answer Habakkuk, and he's trying to tell Habakkuk, nothing can stop God's plan of salvation for us. So once God reveals himself in chapter 3 and who he really is, Habakkuk begins to 
recognized. Uh, maybe he got his answer there. Now, it's not a direct answer, but let's look at chapter 3, verses 17 onwards. If uh, Praveen can just put that. Uh, yeah, there you are. We are now coming to the end of the book, chapter 3. Let's read verses 17 to 19. It says, Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vine, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet, verse 18, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Verse 19, the Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet and he will make me walk on high hills. This is the conclusion of Habakkuk. You remember how he began? Habakkuk begins by complaining. What is happening, God? Why so much violence? Why is there so much of difficulty? Why don't you stop it? Where are you, Lord? That is his, that's the way he begins and his complaint. And he's talking to God about it. But notice how he ends. He ends by saying, uh, though I don't see the fig tree blossoming, though I don't see any fruit on the vine, though the olives may fail. In other words, even though there is trouble, even though there is difficulty, even though there are problems, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Right? In other words, he is basically saying, Lord, you finally have the answer. And I am not going to stop believing in you, trusting in you. I'm not going to stop, you know, having my faith in you. Even though he doesn't understand it. Even though he doesn't see anything good before his eyes like he says there is no fool the the field is yielding no food the flock may be cut off from the fold and no herds in the stalls he's unable to see all the good things that he would like to see yet he says i will rejoice in the lord i will joy in the god of my salvation and he concludes by saying the Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet. In other words, he's saying that I can, I, I, you know, God will give me a way of escape. Like a deer is able to run away from the prey or, or you know, the, 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 the troubles that come. You know, uh, and he says he will make me to walk on high hills. In other words, he will allow me or help me. Give me the strength to conquer and to be above all the difficulties that uh, that are that we are facing. So he's basically saying our circumstances may not change. We may continue to see the pandemic in front of us, but we can continue to change through the power of the Holy Spirit in us. Change to remain faithful to God. Change to be continuing to be conformed to the image of God. So let's conclude then. Uh, just, you know, bring in some applications of what we discussed. Uh, one, one important application we can make from what we discussed is, isn't it interesting that God allows our expressions of pain? Not only... Allowing us to express our pain, he allows us to complain, just as the prophet Habakkuk did, just as the prophet David did in this book of Psalms, on so many occasions complaining, and Job, who complains. God allows that. And he allows these expressions to be preserved in the scriptures. And that's why atheists have a big problem. And they feel that, oh, the Bible cannot be true. Look at all the problems people are facing. And yet, God preserves those in the book, you know, in the good book, uh, though it seems so negative. God is not afraid of that negativity. Or you could say he's not offended 
buy that. Uh, he uh, uh, retains it for a purpose. He knows that human beings are going to discuss it because they, human beings, distance themselves from God and they are facing the fruit of their own choices. God wants those things preserved so that one day perhaps we will see uh, and understand. Another point we can very clearly understand from the book of Habakkuk, especially that evil is offensive to God. He's not offended by our complaints, but he is against evil. I think that comes out very clearly because the prophet Habakkuk says, you are purer, you are of purer eyes than to behold evil. In other words, your eyes are so pure, you're not going to tolerate evil, right? God is not going to look on wickedness. Now, don't get me wrong. That doesn't mean to say God doesn't deal with wickedness. Even when, Abe, when Adam and Eve sinned, he came and spoke to them. And so, uh, but God does want to destroy evil or completely vanquish it. Now, why is he against evil? Because it destroys his creation. It destroys his purpose for us. We struggle because of the evil. And he wants to make sure that we finally rise above that. Uh, another thought, another application we can make is, especially from the thoughts of, uh, of uh, Habakkuk. There's an interesting verse. Uh, I think it is in chapter two. It says, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let the earth be silent before him. Uh, that is chapter two. Uh, we won't go there at the moment, but let me just read that to you again. In chapter two and verse 20, it says, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let the earth, earth be silent before him. Interesting thought that God brings out, uh, you know, in, in, in the discussion. What does it mean? The Lord is in his holy temple. In other words, the Lord has not gone away. He's not run away. He is uh, not saying he can't deal with the problem. God is very much where he's supposed to be. Uh, God is not indifferent. He knows us. He knows our difficulty. And he's asking us for one moment, let the earth be silent. In other words, you know, be still. Isn't that what the psalmist says? Be still and know I am God. Be still and know that I am still there. I am still in control. You may not visibly see me or audibly hear me, but I am there. God has not lost control. He is still working in all of these troubles and in the mess that we brought upon ourselves to guide it to his ultimate purpose. So there may be a time for us to remain silent, even though we, we are allowed to complain, we are allowed to lament, yet there may be a point in time where we can just remain silent and know that God is in his holy temple. God is still working out his purpose here on the earth. And finally, one more thought. Uh, I'll just quote again Habakkuk. He says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will join the God of my salvation. Habakkuk says, I have no way to go. Just like Peter. You remember when Jesus says, are you also going to leave me? After the discussion in John chapter 6, I think it is. Are you going to leave me? And Peter says, where will I go if I leave you, Lord? Where, where do I have the answers? You have the words of eternal life. And that's what Habakkuk says. I will retain my faith in you. Uh, I will rejoice in you. And why does he say that? And I think chapter 3 gives us that answer. You remember I told chapter 3 has God recounts all the greatness and the great acts of redemption, the history of Israel and how he looked after Israel. Habakkuk is saying, I will remain faithful to you because I know you can do great things. I know you are very much caring for us. I know you will finally redeem us. I know you will open the Red Sea and we will walk through on dry land. And that's why Habakkuk says, my faith will remain in you. And because of 
of that reassurance that he gets, the answer he gets from God is basically a reassurance. Don't give up your faith. He finally says in verse 19, chapter 3, the Lord is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet. He will make me walk on, on high hill. And that's how he ends the book. So brethren, I leave it there for the moment. Uh, it's a question that we have probably asked many a times. And, uh, and here is a perspective you can get from the book of Habakkuk. Okay, so let me open it up for some comments. Uh, feel free to uh, bring out any thoughts you might have. Um, any other questions you might have about the book or about the, the larger question that we have discussed. Unmute yourself if you're going to talk. Yes. Yes, Vanessa, go ahead. Okay. It is uh, see, God God knows that whatever is happening. Okay. So uh, can we just question him? Or will he work things in his own time without being questioned? Uh, yes, he will finally work in his own time. But he allows us to question him like just like Habakkuk did, just like David did, just like uh, uh, Job did. Uh, you know, he allows us that because he knows that uh, we are struggling. And so uh, he is getting into a discussion with us. You see, God is allowing us to participate in this whole story, the story of redemption, right? The story that, big, that went wrong because of Adam and Eve's sin and humanity having to suffer. So God is allowing that to happen and God is not afraid of the questions and the questioning that happened. Okay, so that is one thing. But though you question him, that doesn't mean to say God is you know, powerless to do what he ultimately will do. And he will do it in his own time. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but uh, uh, that's... Yeah, what okay. If, if he gives an answer, he of course gives an answer. But then supposing we don't get the answers, we are not able to uh, get the answer, then... Right. Absolutely. And that is exactly some of the experience of the, what do you call it, all the stalwarts in the scriptures, right? All the prophets and the apostles, many of them had no answers. Uh, if you read Hebrews chapter 11, you have a list of people who went through so much of difficulty, but they only, their only answer was God will take care of all the problems. That was the only answer. And that is the answer Habakkuk is giving us. That God finally has the power to take care of all these problems. Just retain your faith in him. Don't abandon the faith. Don't become an atheist. Don't become an unbeliever. Just because you're facing problems. And I think that is a vital point that we need to keep in mind. Okay. Right. Right. We have been called. Sorry, Sikanda, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Right. Oh, we have been called. We face problem. What is our uh, uh, inner thought speaks is we we want to know the meaning of the gospel so that we can grow in God's grace and knowledge. And in that way, we would be uh, getting improved in the uh, in, uh, in righteousness, in correcting ourselves. God has to answer us. That's the thing. Is the sin in us is obstructing or God is delaying the process? Because collectively, all of us, the Christians who are being called out, uh, that gives the light. If we get improved, that gives the light, the splendor. Uh, 
that is the witness the other people get uh, they are changing their light we can see that is the changed behavior changed manners changed circumstances of christian behavior the whole of uh, uh, christian uh, the splendor that they see uh, that we are foreseeing and we are uh, waiting for that okay okay uh, interesting comments uh, maybe uh, what you probably also saying is that sometimes suffering can have value it can help us to grow it can help us to correct ourselves especially if there is if if our suffering is because of sin in our lives yes so yes i think uh, god will allow those things so that we may grow uh but sometimes we suffer even when it is not our fault uh even in that god is able to strengthen us and take us towards the final destination which you know what is that that is his purpose but yes thanks sikandar some interesting thoughts the change itself is prosperity is it church prosperity depends upon the change in life everyone's change in life that is the prosperity uh, if god answers us that will change in a Uh, different velocity speed okay. yes we are changing uh, and we have to because uh, we are being conformed to the image of jesus christ our lord you know finally that is uh, uh, a a very important purpose of god that we conform to the image of god to the fullness so that we can enjoy you know that eternal fellowship with him and you may call it heaven you may call it the kingdom uh, different names but finally that is where we are headed <laughs> right yes vanessa go ahead <laughs> uh, we uh, see we question god okay when when uh, we have uh, we want to know answers we want to know what uh, certain things are happening in the world or in our personal lives or for any reason we question him uh, when does he question us does he ever question us or he just punishes us without questioning us that why we have done something to give a punishment does god question us <laughs> all right now there are many questions in the scriptures that we know that god poses <laughs> to humanity uh and one question that comes to my mind is you know he says why why would you why will you be destroyed you know i mean why are you going in a destructive way you know and uh, uh but you know, i think what you are saying vanessa is that uh Uh, does he give us answers to our questions is that your uh, your query at the moment no hmm. like he, we are punished we are punished for certain sins okay so before before he punishes us does he does he give us a, a question like okay why did you do this when you had this option we don't get that we don't have that re- resolution that okay this is what we have done so for this we are being punished so we are not questioned okay uh i i'm not sure if you uh if you want an audible question from god i'm not sure about that but i'm sure many a times when we suffer we ourselves recognize that uh there are there is something wrong maybe in our lives okay i also want to mention something about the way you use the word punishment now yes the word punishment is in the scriptures uh god even talks about uh punishment but 
it almost seems like God is eager to punish us, right? But that is not right. I think that is not what we ought to understand from the scriptures. God is a loving God and he helps us to grow through the experiences we face. Many a times punishment comes because of our own choices and our own action, right? Uh, uh, it, it says in the scriptures that the wages of sin is death. The word wages indicates that we have earned what we are suffering. It is not God who has to literally come and take a stick and, and give us a good beating like the school teachers used to do. They can't do it anymore. <laughs> God is not eager to take a stick and punish us. He's not eager to condemn us. Uh, but many a times we go through difficult circumstances because of the choices we make or the choices others make. But in all of this, many, you know, we can understand where we have gone wrong and we can correct ourselves. And if you read the scriptures, many a times you can see that God shows us where we probably have gone wrong. Once again, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but... Uh, uh, any other thoughts anybody else can add to what Vanessa is asking? We have a few minutes. Yeah, a couple of things uh, from, I mean, in regards to what Vanessa asked. Uh, number one is about uh, uh, we question God and does God give answers and all. Does God work in his own time or his, he works in our own time? Uh, is it uh, good to question question God? This was the first question uh, she has asked. I personally believe that God is the right place to ask all the questions and express our uh, feelings. Either it is happiness or it is sadness or it is a uh, frustration or uh, uh, it is what, what anger or whatever we have. God is the right place for us to express that. Uh, uh, emotion and those questions. Sometimes when we ask the same question to ourselves, we may not find answers. <coughs> and uh, moreover, we we get into depression. But if we take the same questions and anger and frustration and take it take it in the presence of the Lord and uh, express in front of Him, we would be definitely free from that. And second thing is regarding the answer. Whenever we ask any questions, God definitely gives an answer. But that answer may not be what we are expecting. We always expect some answers in certain way, but they may not be the answers. And uh, we say, does he ever answer in our own time, in our time, or he answers in his time? The thing is, he makes all things beautiful in his time. He answers in his time. It may not be our time. That is the reason we may not be able to see that difference. Uh, when something around us very badly happening. We don't have control, a lot of things, we don't have control over things that are happening around us. But we have uh, some kind of uh, uh, control where, on how we feel painful in our own thoughts and emotions. So how we deal with our thoughts and emotions, that from that's where our pain, resolve, pain re re resides. So if you deal our thoughts and uh, uh, these painful emotions to ourselves, if we keep it to ourselves, definitely they constantly hurt us. If we take it in the presence of the Lord, definitely we can find the healing that brings. Especially God brings healing to us in our own time when we take those things in, into His presence. That happens within us. And we don't know when He is going to remove the same pain that is happening around us. I'm not uh, in in the wider sense. What, around the world, we don't know, but he does it in his time. But when we take our pain in front of him, definitely he will answer us in our own time. With, he deals with us. And that is one thing. Second thing is, uh, many a times we think, uh, oh, if uh, there is no violence around us, if there is no problem around us, if there is no evil around us, then we will be good. But the reality is it is not. All of us are broken. We all have come here from, from a place where there was no evil. We did not start from the world which is full of evil. 
this uh, humanity started from a place where there was no evil there was no pain there was no problem around us and from that situation we have come here so it is an illusion for us to think if we are there we would be free and we will be totally uh, we won't have any issues no the thing is we uh, humans we don't know how to handle ourselves whether it is an, if we are in a good condition also we will have problems if we are in bad condition also we will have problems only god can bring the solution and how the solution would be we don't know but two in two ways he brings the solution number one is he brings solution in our heart that the moment we take our questions and thoughts and emotions before god and express he brings his peace into our hearts through that he gives answer number two he brings solution into the world and uh, how he does we don't know there are lot of problems were happening if we read the history once upon a time people used to torture other people in in the name of punishment or in the name of religion people used to kill other people and god has brought entire humanity out of it now now the rate of uh, say religious kill, killings are less once upon a time there was slavery uh, millions of people struggled we didn't understand how we are going to come out of it god works he works through his people and he brought humanity out of uh, slavery martin luther is a great example whom god used there was polygamy god brought us out of it there was uh, sl- slavery god brought us out of it and uh, there are lot of things god brought uh, uh, a solution to all these things by changing the entire universe mind he brought us we, we are where we are in, t- in terms of we call we speak so called morals and ethics it is the work of god in our life if we are questioning also it is the work of god in our lives if we were there almost uh, 500 years ago i don't think that we would be speaking the questions that we are speaking today the moralistic and ethical questions those days it was different god is bringing the universe in his own style uh, out of it out of lot of violence once upon a time there was so much of violence what uh, pastor to explain about uh, chaldeans how they used to ex- uh, execute violence if in comparison with that now it is lot now we are in a better better position better times now in comparison with them so god is bringing he is bringing answer how he does we don't know and uh, so but definitely he brings healing and he gives answers to us in our hearts so that that uh, that happens the moment we take our questions to god and uh, the last thing i wanted to tell about uh, uh, tell was god does god give us an opportunity to know what mistake we have done before punishing us uh, the answer uh, the, the response i would like to give is he is not interested in punishing us primarily he he is not looking uh, he if he does it, uh, if he de- if he maintains a tab of our mistakes eternity is not enough uh, enough to punish us okay so god that's why scripture says god does not deal with us according to our iniquities but according to his tender mercies so he is not interested in punishing us based on what we do he said that he, and uh, so we don't need to get scared about it because his mercy endures forever if he brings an issue and uh, bring it brings it to the judgment number says so an immediate thing he does is expressing his mercy forever every mistake we do he expresses his mercy forever so that is the gospel that we are speaking about so let us not be scared that god mm-hmm. maintains a tab and punishes based on everything we do well, let us be comforted in the message that jesus has taken all our iniquities upon himself so because of, because of that his mercy endures forever in our lives and we don't have any fear of condemnation like what we discussed last sunday so let us have confidence to come before god as author of hebrew says he understands us and let us express our feelings our thoughts our frustrations our fears everything in front of him because he alone can give us healing from that and around us what is there he takes he, uh, he i don't know how he does it but he is in control as habakkuk says and our job is only to hang on to him
that that's what i would like to good venice if you if you should have any other questions or uh, or the others have any questions feel free to text me uh, and we can always discuss because this is an open forum it is not closed to this just this session feel free to text and we can always have a discussion on this but i i notice the time has gone by uh, we keep this for about an hour or so and so let's end there like i said if you should have questions feel free to text i'd like to end with a prayer and uh, especially that you know uh, i'm in the opening i mentioned about several people who are going through various uh, you know struggles in life uh, especially christiana who is still hospitalized i have, i don't have an update this evening as yet uh, just hoping that she will but you jo- let's all join together and let's just ask for god's mercy in her life mm-hmm. and the others thank you gracious loving father as we uh, end our bible study we thank you father you have reminded us that you are in your holy temple and sometimes even though you allow us to express our pain and our questions and our doubts our confusion in mind there is also a time and maybe father we must just remain silent because you are doing a great work we know one day that all these problems will be sorted out in that assurance in that hope we come and pray for christiana especially father for the special intervention that she needs she needs healing we know father that you have the power to do it you have you raise up dead bones in the resurrection and so father if it is your will at this moment we ask for your mercies towards christiana and restore her to us and to her family i also remember barbara rogers and nasama's family the members who passed away in the philippines i pray for our members right here who are joining us now and anybody in our fellowship going through very painful issues and situations we ask father for your grace and mercy and the reassurance that you are the only place we will find the final resting place and the answers to all the questions of life in that assurance father we pray this in the name of jesus christ our lord and savior amen